it is. So um, I would. It's just setting up now. Away you go. Good evening. On behalf of Table Tennis Scotland, it is my pleasure and privilege to host the last in the series of our YouTube Zoomcast Monday sessions. How fitting should it be that in the hot seat tonight, we bring you the man that's been responsible in bringing you the last 14 weeks of fantastic chat, guests and insight into a fantastic game. Our Performance Director of Table Tennis Scotland, David Fairholm. Um, on the panel tonight, we have Amelia Norbury, who's going to field questions from YouTube with the help of Matt, uh, sort of behind the scenes. Now, Dave, most of us know you as the man with meticulous planning, no stone left unturned when it comes to your players, but it's not always been like this, has it, when you've been responsible for some top players? Well, um, yeah, it was Abraham Lincoln who said, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. And um, I was the head coach along with Peter McQueen, and we were giving debuts to Matthew Side, Michael O'Driscoll, and um, we, we were going to Manchester, where we met, um, and then we were to fly to Sweden via Copenhagen. So I picked up Matthew Side, very, very nervous, he's on debut. I arrive at the uh, Manchester airport, and um, Michael O'Driscoll's dad said to Michael, bear in mind he's a head teacher, uh, you've got your passport, haven't you, Michael? And Michael said, no, you've got it, dad. And then, uh, then mum says, no, Michael, you've got it. And it turned out he'd forgotten his passport. So that was a, um, a fantastic start, really. So believe it or not, in those days, it's different to now. Now, rather than not being allowed to go, we got VIP treatment because he didn't have a passport. We got to the front of the queue through the VIP section and uh, we we boarded the plane to um, Jean Copain in Sweden. However, we stopped in Copenhagen and we had about a three hour stop. So Pete McQueen and myself. Our, our, I mean, bear in mind, we're both experienced coaches. We've done quite a few of these trips. We know what it's all about. And um, we're sitting there reading, chatting to the players, doing quizzes, and trying to make them feel, you know, at ease. And then all of a sudden, after about three hours, it comes up um, on the board, um, JNG364. Right, boys, off we go. So off we all go, march them all in a line, me front, Pete at the back, all the players in the middle, went through security, uh, went through customs, not a problem. And then we boarded the plane. And uh, I said to Pete, I said, this is uh, unlike Table Tennis England, it was called ETTA in those days. Um, they've put us in club class. They've never done that before. We're normally in, in the cattle class. Anyway, so we sat back waiting for our pins and our special treats. Then all of a sudden, somebody came up. Then, then oh, just before then, I turned around and I said to Pete, I said, there's a lot of black people going to Sweden. You know, there's like 80% of the people on the plane are black. And, 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 and there was, we, we were the only sort of white players or people. So then all of a sudden, somebody came up to me and he said, uh, oh, you're sitting in my seat. And I says, no, no. I said, I'm 4A. So this chap says, well, I'm 4A. Then all of a sudden security came and there was all hell let loose because we were on the wrong plane. We were, we were on the plane to Johannesburg and not Jean Coping. So it's a very, very similar number. So we had to do this mad dash from the east side of the um, airport over to the um, west side and, uh, and we just managed to um, catch the plane. So Michael O'Driscoll, no passport, and um, we boarded the wrong plane. And the stick we got afterwards, because at the time, there was no sporting links with South Africa. And they were saying, Dave, you shouldn't be making sporting links with South Africa. So, yeah, so, um, yeah. So we don't always get it right. No, and I think that's a great story of those that know you, Dave. And obviously, I've, I've been in that uh, position over the years, your attention to detail or where it comes to organising 
I think that's a good starting point of those that have had to uh, have the emails from you, the checking of plans. So I think that's a good uh, good reason why. Uh, so right back to start day, table tennis and how you got into it. Uh, where did it all begin for you? Well, in my case, it all began at home because my eldest brother, he played locally to a good standard and he's 10 years older than me. So I'm, I was sort of about eight or nine, but he'd leave his table tennis bat. And the table tennis bat was fantastic for peeling. It was a lovely sensation, peeling off the rubber. So I used to get in trouble for that. But I also had a dartboard as well. And I remember when we interviewed Gavin Rumgay, he said he loved figures. He used to write things down. Well, I was the same. So I'd throw my dart and wherever it landed, 15, then I had to do 15 keepy uppies. And then as I got better, I'd throw three darts and whatever that score was, I then had to, to, to balance. So I got this hand-eye coordination and every time I'd write these scores down and then I'd divide them at the end of the day and, and I'd take an average. My average dart score was this and my average table tennis score was that. So when I then went to the Bridgeway Hall Youth Club to play table tennis, it, it was a little bit instant because I'd just done all this keepy up hitting the ball, throwing the darts, and yeah, and that was me playing table tennis. Um, so obviously back into more competitive table tennis, um, joined, I think, Not Nottingham YMCA, was that correct? Um, it was. Obviously those that were uh, listening to Brian Keane's story a couple of weeks ago, it seemed to be the YMCA uh, clubs or organisations throughout the country responsible in bringing us uh, table tennis players. Uh, so how did we get into that sort of league table tennis, more competitive table tennis? Uh, uh, like all these things, uh, well, they say, look, is where preparation meets opportunity, I guess. But I was playing table tennis at the Meadow Boys Club and, and, um, and I was about the best player there. And I thought, I wonder if I'm the best player in the world, because I've never seen anybody better than me. And, um, and so they entered us into this tournament, and it, you know, it was, and it was a real eye-opener. And, uh, you know, but I managed to win a game, one. I was the only one in our group who had won one. And there was a, a guy named David Strickland. Um, he sort of spotted me, and he, he said, oh, I think you'd do well if you come to the YMCA. And um, so I ventured out from the youth club, went to the Nottingham YMCA. But in those days, it's not like what, for, for, like for Holly and Amelia, where, where, where people are there to help you. You just had to sit and wait your turn. You, sometimes I, I could sit there from seven o'clock till nine o'clock, just hoping somebody had let me on one of the four tables. Then eventually they did. And then you basically had to win to show your worth. And then, and then you slowly went up the pecking order. And very much like Brian Keane, I, you know, once I, I got myself established, I would go in at 9.30 on a Saturday morning, and I'd be there till about 11 o'clock at night, you know, taking the, getting a fish supper or the equivalent and catching the bus back. So it was loads of hours, loads of hours, but with no coaching. It was basically match play and learning from watching people. I mean, obviously those days of playing, Dave, now I sort of mentioned this when we were chatting beforehand, where we had the thing where, we were, where you were being coached by us, or so when you were coaching our group when you were younger, and it's a discussion between a lot of people, no one knew your playing style, because we used to see you chop, and you're great at it, and we see the table controlling and blocking, so maybe a lot of viewers out there, what was David Fairholm's playing style? How did you approach table tennis? Well, um, when I started to, to play competitively and so I think I said to you, I, I jumped from like Division 12 of the local league to Division 3 to the top division. Uh, and bear in mind, Nottingham had about, you know, 12 divisions and they were, they were segregated. And, and, um, uh, and then eventually they had about 20 divisions. And my game was basically, I was incredibly consistent at the level I played, I, you know, and my game was based, I'm a poor man's Des Douglas, um, where I can control most things, but I didn't have the power to, to really beat anybody who was fantastic. So 
a player had to be good and on his game to beat me. And again, exactly what Brian Keane was saying a couple of weeks ago, uh, most people miss more than they get on. So as I was saying to you on Saturday, Mark, I've played somebody with a fantastic loop uh, or a fantastic backhand, fantastic forehand, and they would play the best five shots in our match, but I beat them because they also played the worst 20. So in any game I played, I reckon my opponent probably won the best five points, um, but they also played the worst 15 or 20. So I became very, very, very consistent. And that's also saying to you, but I couldn't wait to tell everybody, you know, if I learned something at table tennis, it, instead of keeping it to myself, I wanted to, I was opposite to everybody else at the Nottingham Lions here. I wanted to help all the new people, you know, but um, yeah, so so my game was block and I would pick off on, on the backhand as well. Fairly tight, fairly good service and a good return serve. I mean, clearly a success, because you sort of mentioned to me, sort of in the local league, and if those that know me, obviously 13 divisions, and sort of modern-day table tennis is unheard of now, in local leagues having so many divisions. And obviously you rose, I think, very quickly, you mentioned to Division 13, up to Division 3, then up to a county standard. Uh, I think you were you mentioned to me you were number two in the county, yeah. uh, in, at senior level. And obviously that level is a great level, but why coaching? What changed you? What turned your head? Why did we move into coaching rather than continuing with a playing career? Well, I would say that it's in my blood. Um, you know, I've, I've always been a teacher, you know, uh, not, not a trained teacher, but I love showing people how, how to do things. But I actually took a year off playing, which was unheard of those days, just to practice. And a practice for a whole year because I reckoned, Mark, that whilst, whilst I was competing, I would never cure a fault because I, I would always go to what I know best. But by taking a year off, I was able to tighten up the game and expand the game. And that is not answering your question at all because you asked me how, how I, I got into coaching. So when I, when I, when I, was Evan this year off? A, a guy named Dennis Collins said, "Have you ever have you thought of coaching, Dave?" I said, "Well, I'm actually thinking of dropping out of table tennis altogether. You know, I've enjoyed my year off." He says, "Well, why, why don't you come back and 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 you know, coaching was in its infancy then, Mark. There wasn't many coaches in any other in many sports, and so I um, I I came back." My, my standard was improving. Uh, I was doing well in some of the open tournaments, not, not to the standard of, of your other 14 guests, but, you know, getting to uh, uh, having decent wins against decent players and finding myself having to play Des Douglas and things like this. And, um, but then I thought, at the time, coaches were almost my age now. You know, they was all old and there weren't that many. And I thought, would it be an idea if I coached and played it at the same time while the whole thing was fresh? And uh, so I started taking my coaching awards when I was still playing at a good standard. And, and frustratingly, I got the respect throughout the region because I had a good playing standard, but I didn't want it. I wanted the respect for being a good coach, not because I could play the game, you know. And um, and all the, to me, there was, there, was, there was two other coaches who also took up the coaching award, and they were very, very good coaches back home, but they didn't have the playing standard, so they had to really earn the respect to the players. And I used to say to the top players, these guys are knowledgeable. Just because you can beat them, it doesn't mean they can't teach you. You know, and as I think Donald Parker said, Mark, um, last week, I mean, Sharon Davis, the Olympic swimmer, um, her coach couldn't even swim. And, um, you know, if you was picking an all-time great team, would you have Arsene Wenger in it? Would you have Jose Mourinho in it? Would you have Alex Ferguson in it? You know, none of them are great players, but they've all become good coaches. So I, 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 I quickly learned that... Coaching was a little bit like an 100-yard race. If you've played the game, it did give you a 30-yard start. But if you didn't um, 
train, you wouldn't make that other 70 yards. So, so, the, the, so that was me on the, the coaching ladder. You're not going to ask me about my first coaching session, are you, Mark? I well, I'm just about to go on to that, Dave. I think it was quite a, good, um, a great story to share. Uh, where all this work you put in, the meticulous planning. So, yes, talk me through oh. David Fairholme's first ever coaching session. Well, there I am. I'm still the county number two. Uh, I've just beat the Derbyshire number one. I've, I've, I've had a good week and um, I've just got my first coaching qualification. So I go back to my old youth club, the Meadow Boys Club in Nottingham, and I see, see the old leader there, who was quite helpful as well, uh, Skip. And I says, I two up, I'm, I'll do some coaching for you. So, so Skip says, yeah, yeah, sure. I says, what I'll do is we'll, I'll put the posters up. Dave Fairham, county player, ETTA coach. I said, we'll fill the hole. We'll fill the hole, Skip. So anyway, so all these posters went up and I was planning. I had, the, I had this vision in my head that I'd turn up in the gym and there'd be about 50 of the local kids all worshipping me, the coach. And anyway, I turned up on the Monday and, and nobody turned up. Absolutely zero. And, and the only other time I've experienced, well, I've experienced that a few times. If people know me, then they don't turn up. But the, the other time I was with Andy Bruce um, and was in the Caribbean in St. Vincent. And they flew us to Union Island to run this session on Union Island. If you know the Caribbean, it, it's a small island. Anyway, when, when Andy Bruce and I got to um, Union Island, the guy um, in security, he was so fussy. He said, what's in that bag to Andy? Uh, some of you, do, do, do you know Andy Bruce, Mark? I do, yes, going back in time. Oh, yes. So, so Andy opened up his bag. And, and then I opened my bag and then it got out these table tennis bats. And, and I thought, uh, he thinks, I'm sure he thinks we've got drugs. And then he says, where are you going? So I says, well, we're actually going to play, we're running a coaching session, you know, at the community hall. And he looked at us, looked at Andy and looked at me. He says, is it okay if I come? <laughs> so he just closed the airport. He just closed the airport. And he says, oh, the planes can wait. So we went to do this session. And again, he was the only one there. So, so we got this one-to-one -one coaching for about an hour and a half. So then we went back to the airport. And, it, well, you can imagine what it's like in the Caribbean. It's about 30 degrees. So I said to him, well, is it OK if I go for a swim, as, you know, while we're waiting for the plane to come? And he says, sure. He said, just walk along the runway and jump in at the end. I mean, can you imagine that? Either way. So because the, the airport, the runway basically was the length of the um, airport. So anyway, so off I went. And I, and I said, oh, when do I come back? And he says, oh, you'll see the plane circling. I, so there I am swimming away, skinny dipping away. And then, then, then this, this plane came in. So yeah, so that's two stories about when no, nobody turned up. But uh, yeah, so there we are. Brilliant, Dave. So you will see Dave on our Zoomcast. We've been joined by our first special guest of the evening, a man that you know very well, our 12-time Scottish champion, Ewan Walker. Ewan, welcome to the session this evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Dave. Good to see you in the hot seat. Good. I know, I know. I've been very, I, I don't mind telling the guests, I've been very nervous. I'm quite relaxed now, but yeah, I've been quite nervous about it. Well, oh, we good, good, change to, that. So, good to see you Ewan, dressed up for the occasion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ewan, just to start with, we'll, we'll come back to Dave's story and table tennis very shortly. But just to start with, when did you first meet Dave uh, regarding your table tennis? So uh, I was trying to remember that. So I think it was early 1990. Um, I think um, I, I can't remember exactly when you got given the post, but I think I think you appeared at a training camp in Largs, um, either kind of end of January, start of February 1990, I think. Um, and 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 so you you weren't taking the camp. I think you you know this was just kind of almost day one or something of the. Of you being in post so, so he came and you know introduced us and said a few words of introduction and 
and, and certainly, you know, we, I didn't know Dave, and, and I think many of the others didn't know Dave at that time. So, so he was definitely a bit of a man of mystery, but but came came uh, came well, well, um, you know, with, with a good write up in terms of, of how the how we'd done an interview, and you know, kind of you know done really well at the interview. So so yeah, so it, it was intriguing. You know, came with um, I say lots of a good backstory and where you know where David. You know the the achievements and accomplishments in his background, and, and you know obviously the success you had down in Reading and that kind of uh, centre of excellence, and you know the, the quality of players that, that you had there. So, so yeah, so so it was Inverclyde early nineteen ninety, and then literally I think it was, it was it was literally a handful of days later we then played Switzerland in a European League match, and and that was my first senior international my, my first you know in the first team if you like uh, and and so I think you came along and sat on the bench that time and just kind of uh, kind of got the got the, the feel of, of of how you know we operated in the, the team that was at the time and so so that was it so, so Dave's kind of very first days and the, the job coincided with my very first days in the national team so in that sense it was you know it was ideal you know a new coach new player and uh, you know it kind of went on from there and actually, it was it was actually the same, I guess, for for Ian Stokes. We, you know, we covered session with Ian a number of weeks ago, and and you know, very similar. Ian had kind of flirted in and out of the team a little bit, but but this was again his first kind of real breaking into the the first team. So so it all kind of coincided in time really nicely. The, the perfect storm, as they say, of uh, players uh, joining, and obviously Dave, um, obviously the partnership that used to have formed over the years. Obviously, I remember being a young player coming up and obviously Dave being a national coach. Uh, and I think even when Dave, if I'm right in thinking, you and when Dave sort of stepped down as national coach, he was still in your corner, obviously, as you're uh, following your singles career and sort of had an influence on you at big events and helping you at that time, if that's right. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I guess we'll maybe talk later about um, this kind of different facets of, of the role and coaching and the corner play, but... Um, you know, I, I've had a number of good people in, in, in the past in, in my corner and, and, and been lucky enough to kind of experience, you know, a, a host of good coaches. But, you know, without doubt, Dave was, was by far for me the best um, corner man I ever had. Um, and, and I think it's also true to say, OK, you know, we started off life, you know, Dave was the coach and I was a player. And but, you know, clearly over the years, we've developed more into far more of a friendship um, over the years. So. So, you know, you know, it obviously worked well for me in terms of having Dave McCorner, but, you know, that was his friends as much as, you know, having, you know just having the, the best coach in McCorner. Well, yeah, I'm going to audit your bank statement later, Ian, just see how much you <laughs> You're supposed to be a surprise guest, but uh, obviously a bit of payment change hands there. Um, Amelia, Holly, you've been sitting patiently. Do we have any questions on YouTube for Dave before we continue on the story? Um, quite a couple have come through. So I guess we'll just cover a few. Yep. Um, so there's one from Shannon Brown who said, would you recommend coaching and playing at the same time or just to pick one? I, I, I really feel if you want to make a player, you shouldn't coach. Uh, but unfortunately, you sometimes need to make a, a living. I mean, I can honestly say that there's, there's, there's probably three reasons I didn't become a world-class player. One is lack of talent, but that was only a small thing. But two is I had to go to work. But the third thing was I did play and coach. And it wasn't people say that when you're coaching, you then start feeding the ball and then you start feeding the ball when you play matches. And you, But no, that wasn't the case. What was happening in my particular case, I. I was, as I was, I was still playing, as to say, decent county, but I was then coaching three or four nights a week and it was the lack of motivation to, to train. And I, you've got lots of years to coach. And I would say, and, and it was interesting because Craig, Craig Bryan said the opposite. He felt coaching improved his game. So, you know, there's never one answer to these things. But personally, Personally, I worry about how much coaching Colin's doing um, and, and even Gavin, you know, because I've not given up on Gavin uh, and I think they both do too much coaching and I, I say, look, you've got 30 or 40 years ahead of you, 
when you finish playing, where you can really concentrate on your coaching. And, and um, so to Shannon, I would say, you keep up, you carry on playing. You're the cadet champion now. You've got lots of uh, um, bridges to cross and uh, you, yeah, leave coaching till later. Um, Sinclair Houston said, has there been a player who you felt could have made a go of going full time, but for whatever reason decided not to? Um, I, I, I mean, what, what, uh, I'm not just saying it because Ewan's there, but Ewan played some world-class table tennis. He definitely played world-class table tennis lots of times, sometimes for whole matches and sometimes for, for part of matches and he'd be full time he, and he had lots of good wins in his career but I, I there's no doubt about it he would have been a much better player had, had he be, had he have gone full time and um, there's, there's, there's no doubt about that you know not, not a little bit better miles better because those big wins would have been would have been would have been far more oh. you're back again Dave the, the bigger wins would, would have been um, they would have been far far more far more consistent and um, uh, and um, yeah yeah so um, um, I, I yeah, yeah play, there's no doubt because anybody who plays full time is in any sport will almost certainly do better than somebody who's doing it part time. You and just just to jump in there, what what's your thoughts about that? Is Dave correct? Do you feel like, yeah. from your perspective? Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. I mean, I think we, we covered it in, a, in an earlier Zoom. You, you know, clearly you, you make your choices and, and you have, you have you know, difficult decisions to make when you're kind of late teens. And in that sense, I wasn't any different. I, th I mean, Dave's absolutely right in terms of, you know, the both the quantity of practice you're able to put in if you're playing full time, but also the quality, your preparation for that practice as well is that much better. So the sole focus of your day is about how are you going to kind of what you're going to do during that practice, how you prepare for it, how you prepare your body and mentally. Whereas if you're studying or coaching or working or whatever it is, then it's you're fitting it in around other stuff. And so it's undoubtedly the case that um, anybody, you know, all things being equal, would benefit from from playing full time compared to not. And yeah, I I. I don't doubt that, that I would have been the same. I, certainly the peers where I was operating on you know, the world ranking list, I was about 200 odd. And certainly you look around and that that was, it was all dominated by kind of full-time players. There. And certainly if you wanted to move up the list, you you absolutely were having to be consistently, you know, very good players. And so, you know, it's just the way it goes. Brilliant. Yeah. Now, before we move to our next guest of the evening, is there any more questions on YouTube, girls, before we move on? Oh, you could do maybe one or two. Yeah, um, there's one from Colin Green saying, after last year's successful summer school in Largs, are you planning to continue next summer? And if so, how do you see it developing? Well, if, um, I guess it all depends on lockdown, but we, I mean, Mark um, goes back to the very early summer schools we did back in the 90s. Um, bear in mind, we did success, you know, I used to do, do them at Crystal Palace and Oxford and, and all over England. So we developed it um, at Largs in the early ones. Um, people like um, Gillian Edwards was a 10 year old when she first came. And then, anyway, um, and then you used to come and help you, didn't you? you I, know, did. I did, I remember them well. Yeah, yeah, in yeah. August. We've got some good practice. But then, unfortunately, when my role finished, which was in 1998, there wasn't anybody to pick up the summer schools because, again, there wasn't anybody full time. So we resurrected it last year, and it was a great, as, as the um, YouTuber, so I didn't get his name, was it? Colin Green. Co oh, Colin. Brilliant. Yeah, well, Colin came. Colin came um, two days. Is a, he became a player coach. Uh, and it was a great asset as well. And I, I was really ready for this one because we got a lot of repeat customers as well. And it was looking to be a great, you know, summer school. But no, we'll be back. As soon as we're allowed back, we'll be back running the summer schools again. Definitely. Yeah. 
Any more questions, Holly? Um, there's one from Joan Smith saying, do you think you can still improve as a player in your 50s? Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, 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 if you take my cricketing career, I scored my first 100, my only 100, I should I say, you know, when I was 54. Um, and, and I mean, it, I guess a lot depends when you start playing. So if, if you've started playing as, um, as, as a seven-year-old uh, and then you continue to play, uh, my... I guess you, you would not improve as a 50-year-old. But if you take somebody like Joan, who's multi-sport, a bit like Gavin, plays everything. They ought to have a competition, actually, Gavin and Joan, because um, Joan, Joan plays all, all the racket sports. Um, and she'll give you a whooping it squash, Gavin. <laughs> and, um, I, um, but, yeah, I mean, in Joan's case, she came to table tennis quite late, and therefore, definitely, you know, you, you, I mean, one thing you have to remember when somebody, sometimes people will say, I've had 25 years experience. Well, have they had 25 years experience or have they had one year's of experience and just repeated it 25 times? So, you know, it really is important to, to you know, not just kind of just carry on doing the same thing. But to answer Joan's question, uh, in, in Joan's particular case, the answer is definitely yes. And if, if you didn't start playing table tennis and, and until your late teens or early 20s, then there's no reason why you can't, can't improve. Brilliant. Amelia, Holly, thanks very much. Come back to you later on with some more questions. Uh, so Dave sort of gave the game away there. We joined by our second guest this evening, uh, Mr. Gavin Rungay, our 14 time Scottish champion. Um, Gavin, we sort of asked you when he joined the chat, what was your first memory of David Fairholm? Uh -huh. you can you can hear me, everyone? Yes, hear you loud and clear, Gav. Super. Yeah, my, my first memory uh, of Dave was was at the the Lethem Centre in Perth, and I think he was going he was going through one of his uh, master classes. Uh, it was very entertaining, and you know it, it's definitely stuck with me over the last 20, 25 years of that being one of the, you know, the fondest early memories of my table tennis career. Uh, you know, and, and Dave, you know, you, you, you were very good at communicating, uh, you know, how to break down the shots uh, right, from the, right from the off. And I enjoyed that. And, you know, through the years then, Eric Lundberg and obviously Mark, you know, did well to uh, to start bringing other coaches in, but but definitely that that's that was a very early memory that that stuck with me was was you coming up to do that exciting masterclass using different types of rackets, attacking, defending, uh, and yeah, it was very entertaining. He didn't get the frying pan out, did he? <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, see, I remember me Dave, Dave taking us. Did taking us on these sessions and he run an exhibition and I thoroughly enjoyed that. It's one actual memory. It's not about winning tournaments, but actually running sessions uh, in front of hundreds of school children and being sort of school <laughs> child myself uh, and me and Gavin doing the exhibitions and Dave coordinating it. Um, it was brilliant. Um, I mean, latterly, Gavin, Dave has been in your corner, World Championships. Uh, how have you found them? We'll obviously touching this sort of later on a little bit, but as a corner man, um, how have you found Dave? working with them, playing for Scotland? Yeah, I mean, obviously for uh, for years and years, early early 2000s and through, uh, always, I was always on the, the receiving end of, of Dave coaching Ewan to, you know, many, many titles. Uh, so, so, yeah, I mean, just quality, you know, it was, I really enjoyed that tournament out in, in Budapest. Uh, there was myself, Callum Morrison, Neil Cameron. So it was a bunch of characters. Uh, and again, I just remember, you know, Dave just simplifying things in the corner. You know, a lot of coaches can fire too much information to their player. So you go back from a timeout or, you know, a one minute interval and you've got 10 or 15 things to worry about and then you don't actually do any of them. So it's very important you know, communication skills wise to just 
simplify things down. What do you need to do? You need to pick up the half long serve. Uh, when you're receiving serve, you should be pushing more. You should be flicking more. Something very simple. And, and that, again, is what stuck with me from Dave's coaching in Budapest. Simplifying things down so that I could play and execute my game plan. Brilliant. And then I think, I mean, having 26 national titles to you and Gavin, of course, my three runner-up from junior days, <laughs> it's very important uh, to throw that in there. And I think so far we're getting some fantastic insight from you and Gavin about obviously table tennis in general. But it's time to take Dave back on a story. I feel like a young Michael Aspel. Uh, this is your life. Um, so Dave, back, back to your story, talking about 1979, uh, English national coach, or one of the national coaches. Um, how did that come about? Uh, it's important, obviously, in your journey of how you've um, become a professional coach, but that was your first important position. So, how, how, I mean, I think there's an interesting story about a game of football in there as well. And you know, those oh. are football's a huge part of his well, coaching well, sessions. You'll know, have to sort of keep me right on this. But so <clears throat> to continue the story, um, I, I was still playing county and. Um, um, but I was developing up the coaching ladder. Um, and Peter Simpson was a great influence on me, and and so was Peter Hurst. You know, they they, they were both uh, national coaches at the time, and I was going, being invited to run regional sessions, which is you know, which you're talking about players like Alan Cook and Michael O'Driscoll and Chris, you know, all the all the kind of real 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 quality players, and. I remember we was running a course at Lee Green and I'd been to a few of the conferences and there was, I think, 50 of the top coaches in England at the time. And I'm embarrassed to say this, but Mark said I should say it. I looked around and I thought, I'm better than all of them. I, I did. I, I, and I'm almost embarrassed to say it on this Zoom class. I thought, well... You know, I've, I've seen them all. Some of them are better players than me. Some of them are academics, but I, yeah, I think I'm better than all of them. So the job came up um, as the national coach. And in those days, back in 1979, you know, there wasn't like 50 full-time development officers in several different sports. There was very rare positions and there were sought after positions as well. Now, when I applied, I was encouraged by Don Parker to apply and by Peter Hurst to apply. But when I applied, um, there was headmasters, you know, applied um, and there was top international players applied. And, um, and I was so pleased to get the interview. I mean, I've, 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 you know, I was, I was so pleased just, just to get an interview. And I really prepared myself for this interview. And as I said at the start, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. And I actually fell and I turned up in a suit, don't laugh, and at Crystal Palace. And I sat a brilliant interview. Honestly, I, I, I sat a brilliant interview. And I came out of the interview room and Peter Hurst said to me, how, how did that go? And I said, well, Pete, if I don't get the job, I... I I, I don't mind because I've given it my best shot. It's like when you play table tennis, if you've given it your best shot. And then if I move, if I move the story on, um, I, I, um, if I move this, the story on, I was playing football in that July, in the July, and I, I was playing fantastic. I'd scored two goals. And then halfway through the second half on a wet pitch, the ball came and I sliced the ball and my heel hit the floor and I torn my um, ACL, my cruciate ligament. So there I was, 10 football pitches. I had to hop on my left leg to the changing rooms. I was in absolute agony. The ambulance was waiting to pick me up. Um, well, I got taken home. And then the phone call came through to say, you know, I'd been made um, national coach for England. And then, then I went off to... Um, um, ho hospital to have, have, have my knee sorted out. So, yeah. So, uh, my first day as the national coach uh, was on crutches and, uh, and the big um, um, plastic cast. But I, 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 I always thought that was the best day of my life, you know, because that was a massive breakthrough. You know, that was a massive breakthrough. 
And two months later, Forrest won the European Cup. And I thought, damn, that's the best day. Which Dave, is the best Dave just, just to stop you, yeah. I think it's taken until 20 to 8 or 40 minutes in, and it's the <laughs> first time Nottingham Forest has been mentioned. <laughs> that's the biggest shock of this evening. <laughs> I've lost a bit nah. already, haven't I? <laughs> yeah. I mean, however, right. however, however, just to put things in perspective, I used to think being made the national coach was the best day of my life. Forrest went in the European no, the best day of my life was the birth of my first daughter. When Elisha was born on the 9th of April, it put the Forest match in, and the national code. That was the greatest day of my life. And I wouldn't be surprised if Ewan and Gavin would say, say the same thing. Honestly, Absolutely. nothing, nothing was, nothing. Absolutely. Yeah, I was just about to turn to the guy you say, I bet I'm sure that they would agree uh, yeah. with, that, with that sentiment. Um, so, I mean, Dave, to move along the story a little bit, it's Christmas Day, 1979. Yes. What are you about to go and do? I mean, you mentioned about watching other coaches, but what yeah. is David Fairholm going to do on Christmas Day, 1979? Well, just to put things in perspective, whenever I was in a coaching session, whether it was at Crystal Palace or Lee Green or Lillishaw or Bissam Abbey, I'd always take time out when my session was finished and sit in the stand. And if Judy Murray was running a tennis session, I'd, I'd kind of watch her or, or Pete Mintoff, fantastic basketball coach. I'd just sit and look at his body language and the way he coached. And I thought, I know what I'll do. Um, it's Christmas Day. I'll go and watch Nottingham Forest train because they, they always train on Christmas Day. So off I got up about nine o'clock in the morning, got to the ground and they weren't training on their practice pitch. They was actually training in the main stadium, the city ground, and they were European champions as well at the time. And anyway, so I'm just about to enter the ground and then a voice says, young man, where do you think you're going? And I says, oh, I'm hoping to watch the team training. And he says, it's a private session. He said, um, you know, because we've got a match tomorrow, so you won't be able to. Now I've come all this way to watch. Anyway, I went back to my car, but I, my car was boxed in. And little did I know at the time, it was Peter Shilton who boxed me in, because he obviously thought anybody who'd parked the car in a, in, in, in a car park at Nottingham Forest Football Ground on Christmas Day must be one of the players or staff. And typical Peter Shilton, he, 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 he cut down the angles so I couldn't get out, no matter... <laughs> I went left, right or middle. And then anyway, I had to sit there for about an hour and a half while they did this training session. Then Peter Schilt came out and he, 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 um, he, um, he, he apologised and, and everything. Okay. And then, it, 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 you know, it, it, it became news that I was the, you know, in, in the Nottingham news that I'd become the national coach. And then I got a letter from Brian Clough inviting me to train with the team. You know, so um, I got permission off my boss and... Off I went to, to, uh, to have a week with the European champions. And on the Friday, I even got a, even got a game. At the time, there was, there was um, Colin Barrett, some of the older viewers might remember, in the left back, he, he, was on a, he was on a fitness trial at the time. And the coach said to Colin Barrett, if you go on for 10 minutes, and that, that made it uneven. And I've been there training and watching. Liam O'Kane said to me, do you want, before I finished the sentence, I was on the pitch. <laughs> no way was you going to get. So that was my claim to fame, you know, actually on the pitch with the European champions for 10 minutes. There we are. That, that's brilliant, Dave. Now, that is a great story to share. Um, I feel sorry for Holly and Amelia, Peter Shilton in 1979. Just a bit of context. England goalkeeper at the time. Legend. Um, so we're going to move on to the Shaw fire round. Now, Dave, you would know this as a quick fire round, okay? Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to get Holly and Amelia to read that out. But before I do so, we have a wee tale about Dave from Peter Shaw. Uh, oh. So those who know Dave and Peter have been great friends over the year. Uh, I think for any player in Scotland, um, I've been around as a Peter Shaw, great character. So a few things about Dave from Peter Shaw. Ian Stokes used to turn up to squad training in his fruit and veg van. Dave would stand at the back of the van to get the leftovers. He would shout to Ian, throw over some of those bananas. That's how the banana flick was invented. 
<laughs> Once at large, Ian drove off without realising Dave was rummaging in the back of the van and they both ended up in Glasgow. Some people say that was the only occasion a nas national coach, Dave, ever visited Glasgow. <laughs> That's very unfair. The real truth is the incident never happened. Ne Dave never been to Glasgow. The players say Dave is a great team captain. And even the opposing players say he can be dazzling in the corner. That's why they often ask the umpire to make him wear a hat. Lots of people know this one, and we know this already, and he's proved it tonight, he can't do it, but 10 senses is the longest Dave has ever gone in conversation without mentioning Nottingham Forest. These people know Dave gets a headache if he goes more than five days without mentioning Forest's European Cup victories. Dave also plays some steady Eddie cricket. I'll not say he's boring at the crease, but one bowler fell asleep during the run-up. Finally, as a special tribute to Dave, We've now named the quiz, the slow quiz. <laughs> Holly, Amelia, over to you for the questions. And Dave, you uh, can take your time answering them. Okay. So the three most important qualities a caption should have and why? Uh, you must know the player. That is, is really important. And um, if, because I'm going to do um, a Brian Keane now. Um, Ian Rind, one of our coaches, he's, he's written a paper and he wants the captains to crack, to follow a player, you know, into the training hall, into the competition and, and for match play. So, so know your player is, um, is, is the... So what's the question again? <laughs> can, you, can you fire the question again? I'll go again. What are the most important... Qualities a caption should have and why? Yeah, as I say, know, know your player um, and be, be honest, you know, I think be honest with, with your player and, and obviously know, know the subject. Genuinely, do you give tactical advice before asking what the player thinks? Well, I did a course on this at Loughborough University and it's interesting because as a beginner, the style you use is a command style. In other words, they know very little and, and therefore you're, you're sort of giving them 90% of the knowledge of, of what they should be doing. But as a player progresses, they begin to know their own game. And then when you get to Gavin's level and Ewan's level, at that point, it is a re reciprocal arrangement. I, I can't just say to Gavin, you must do this, that and the other. I mean, when we worked together in Budapest, we, he, he would talk to me about what he felt. Um, I'd give him my tongue's worth. And as, as I've said on many occasions, only three things a captain should really try and do in the corner is one, where is winning the points, two, where is losing the points, and three, um, if there's a change of tactics that you feel should take place. You know, keep, keep your advice simple. So, therefore, it changes with the level of the player, the, the style you use. Yeah, this, uh, that kind of leads on to the next question, which is, generally, is your advice firm or suggested? I'll say it's firm. I'd say it's firm. You know, either don't give advice because they because that player has only got a minute. It's no good saying, well, maybe you should, have, but you know, maybe. Oh well, it, yeah. It, it, it has to be firm. Don't be afraid of saying nothing. But if you're going to say something, be decisive. Yeah. It's a sports car firm, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you ask? if the players agree with the advice? No. Okay. Are you aware of tailoring your style of delivery for different players? For example, tone of voice or body language? Yeah, yeah, I would say so, yeah. And, and, and it's been said many, many times, you know, uh, some players, uh, with Ian Stokes, I used to annoy him because that was the best way to, uh, I mean, we was over in, Another little story, it's interesting. Uh, it was over in um, Singapore. Was it Singapore where we just missed out on a medal? You know, was it no. India? Yep, no, Singapore. Was it Singapore? Singapore. In, in the sweet box. Yeah, it was a... Uh, was in Singapore and 
and uh, Ewan was winning all his games and Ian was losing all. And I got really fed up with it. It was playing absolute garbage. And I said to him, I said, I said to him after one game, I said, Ian, I said, have you ever played this game? And he went absolutely silent. He went absolutely silent. Went on, won his next game, played Malaysia. And it was world class. It was world class. He won both his games. And he came up and he said, yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pass um, on that. So what is the most significant single piece of game changing advice you can recall giving to someone? Um this this been quite a few. Um I I I probably I mean, if I was to, at times I've captained you in, I remember captaining him against Michael O'Driscoll and I felt what we suggested was a game changer. I, I feel that, because I'm better talking about more recent times, I've got a whole list there, but if you take when I took Gavin to Switzerland, he played against two players who he'd lost to previously, and and just just maybe um, making him be decisive, you know, which was my only advice really in Switzerland. Gavin, be decisive, you know, don't don't be half. And and maybe that that was a game changer. But the biggest one, um, and Ewan was there as well, which, which was quite it was amazing because it was in the USA in Indianapolis. And Ian Stokes was fantastic. I mean, he'd taken two against Japan. Ewan had got to the final of, of the under-21s. 2017, not Mr. Sitter, but there we are. It's another story. But, but, when, we was, but, but when we was practising, um, a lady came over and she was the American... She was the American number one, albeit there was there was two or three Chinese Americans who were much better. And she joined us in the practice. Her name was Alice Kimball. And in fact, you and played mixed doubles with her, didn't you? As yeah, well. yeah, yeah. So we, we kind of swapped, you know, it, it made four of us able to practice. And then and then Alice, although she was representing America, she asked if I could coach her because she, it's, it's, I've said on many of these Zoom casts. You'd often go to a tournament, there'll be two coaches and five players, so they all don't get. So I was allowed to coach Alice. And she was playing against the American Chinese number one, who she normally lost to about eight, eight and nine, because it was up to 21 then. Anyway, so Alice went on the first game. She lost it about 21 eight. She came over to me and, and I, I just, Alice, you are offering no threat whatsoever. They're all long rallies because you're a chopper and she's the nice short swing looping it. She's just going to wait and wait and wait. And she's going to just pick you off as she's done there. You're going to have another 39, another 29 great rallies, but you're just going to lose them all. I said, you must be a threat. You must be a threat. I know from our practice sessions you can hit. And if you don't hit one in at least one in five of your serves or two in five of your serves, you just offer that threat. Um, then you're going to... Anyway, she won the second. I think you were watching you. And I don't know if you remember that. It was incredible. It was an incredible turnaround. And then it got to about 15 all in the third game. And like... A lot of players, and I'd, I'd like to come on to a game that you and played against Matthew Side as well. It's, it's at about 15 all, Alice just had to go back to a safe play and never threatened the hit again. And, and she lost it 21 15. But the remarkable thing about that story is then all the press gathered round and the TV cameras, but they all came to me. It was, it was incredible. The coach. In America and in Russia, they, they're highly bad. So they, they didn't want to talk to uh, to Alice Alice at all, you know. And um, and it, it was an ama it was amazing, really, because you know, the coaches are really valued in the states. But but um, that was a, a sort of game changing. And I remember coaching Ewan against Matthew Side, and Ewan ran out of patience at about eighteen all, 
you know, it, it, about 18 all in the third down in Basingstoke, and he just rushed his last few shots and he lost. But, but it, it was in his memory bank. And the next time he played Matthew's side, it was a world class player, you and beat him. So sometimes that defeat and doing the right tactics and getting wrong in the end, as long as you learn from it, then, you know, you've, you've got it. That was a long answer, wasn't it? Well, that's, <laughs> that's why Pete changed the name of it to the Slow Fire. Uh, yeah, that was, that's a good job you did. <laughs> um, so the next question is, can you recall an opposing captain coming up with a game changer in a big match? Probably lots. I mean, one I remember the most was I'd only just taken the role as the Scottish national coach uh, and we played against Ireland and we were favourites to beat them. And they had a very good German coach. And I'd say our players, it was Andy Bruce, David Niven and Kevin McKellar. Uh, they were favourites to win. But I actually, I actually felt that um, their coach motivated the players a lot better than I did that day. Yeah. Um, did you ever wish that you could return a game because you realised too late what the right tactics were? Oh, every time, every time. Oh, I replay these games. I wish I'd have called Gavin over in Budapest, you know, when it was starting to go against him. Um, um, there's been often... It's with, with hindsight, when you look at a game, you think, damn, if only it could have... Yeah. No, I have to say, lots of times I'd be lying if, if, I, if I didn't. Um, who was the team captain you least like to see with the other team? Well, funny enough, the coaches are, are a little bit like the goalkeeping union. You know, we all kind of sort of... We all side up with each other. And probably Thomas Werner of Sweden. He, he was the, 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 the coach who turned it round for Sweden. I mean, Don Parker talked about Glenn Hoos, but Thomas Werner was like um, Glenn Hoos's boss and he really established and, and he had a really good philosophy for a lot of ad, admiration for him, yeah. And, and yeah, probably I wouldn't like him in the corner opposite to me. Um, and the last one is, what international team captain do or did you admire the most from any country? Well, it's the same, um, um, Thomas Werner, Sweden. Brilliant. Um, I also just, I mean, we're going to move on, I think, to Dave's favourite Commonwealth or world team. Uh, but I also want to get you in and Gavin to answer this one as well. So, Dave, if you say, remind me, your favourite world team and Commonwealth team, was that the question that you really wanted to answer? Yeah. Is that right? Uh, yeah. right. This, this question is often asked on a, a Sunday morning at um, a Sunday morning for, uh, at the Irish podcast, and, and you're asked to nominate your, your best, best teams. Right, now, first of all, I'd be better organised. I'd have Alan Strong from Ireland. He would be the chef commissioner. That's the right word. And I'd have Pete Charters as the team manager. There'd be an exhibition before, and I'd have Colin and Wilson and Dave Barr doing that because they did the uh, best uh, exhibition. And then the ladies' team, I'd, I'd have Ding Yapping, who's won 18 world titles, probably the best female player that there's ever been. Pat Young-sung, so we've got one from China, one from North Korea, and Pat Young-sung, won, she won two gold medals, um, so two world titles when, when it was Chinese-dominated, fantastic achievement. And then I'd have Jill Hammersley as my, my, my third, um, third player. Uh, I'd let uh, Peter Shaw um, captain that team, uh, but then I've got to pick a Commonwealth team, haven't I? So my Commonwealth team would be Richard Yule, Alan Griffiths and Don Parker. Now, I would want some bag carriers. So I'd have Ewan and Gavin. You can carry the bags <laughs> along with Ian and Johnny Cowan. You'd, they'd all be my bag carriers. 
And because we play in cold venues, um, I would have Gordon Clancy, he would be warm in the seats. He would be my bench man. So Gordon would go there every day. And, um, and anyway, my ladies team would win all the medals and my men's team, uh, Richard, Alan and Don, uh, just by, I mean, it's nothing to do with that. They all happen to be former national coaches. I don't, you know, I'm not showing any bias to hope. And I'll enjoy Boss and Gavin and you and Ian and Johnny around while they're, <laughs> while they're catching all the bags. How about that? I knew this is a bad idea of letting you prep your own question. There, you <laughs> too organised. Um, Gavin? What about your world team? Now, actually, I just want to make reference. I only just picked up on it a short time ago of Gavin's name on the, the Zoom cast. The phone phone. Zoom <laughs> phone. So, if you can anyone see was coached by Dave at Largs back in the day, and if you weren't in the foam dome, you didn't have the experience. So, anyone that knows Largs has a gymnastics hall at the back, full of foam. Dave was a registered gymnastics coach, was allowed to. Uh, take us in, and I think as juniors, every junior in Scotland at Largs got a session. Even I could do a front flip uh, into the foam. So I love it, Gav. A great, great reference to uh, being coached by Dave. The foam. They, they were great, weren't they? The three days at Largs. I miss, miss some of those camps in those early days. You know, yeah, two no, or three years of that, didn't we? It was, yeah, it was a lot of I think, I mean, it just shows maybe the class of a Scottish table tennis player where uh, we're more interested to get playing in the foam than practising sometimes. Or maybe that's just me. Maybe that's why I never reached that, that levels that I should. <laughs> um, Gav, what about a world team from you? Uh, men, women, we maybe give a sort of team a 2v2, maybe one man, one woman. Um, yeah. Sort of players from around well, the world. Well, I mean, the, I mean, maybe players that you admire as well. Yeah. Uh, again, because, you know, myself and Ewan have been to so many world championships uh, and if, you know especially for me losing very early most of the time you've got a lot of time to be in the practice hall watching these top players and sometimes you're very fortunate to be cross knocking on the same table as some of them uh, and probably one of the most relaxed players I've ever played against and I've practiced with is Ho Sang Un. So I think I would throw Oh Sang Un in there. Uh, by the fact, I think in 25 years, I've never flicked a serve. He's probably got one of the best flicks in the world. So uh, we'll stick him in the team. Uh, and another one, probably Alexei Smirnov, the Russian number one, or Russian number one for about 10 years. Uh, again, probably the, the younger generation won't, won't know him, but again, one of the best serves I've ever played against. Flying in reverse serve. Uh, and he beat me four sets to two, and he took me aside at the end, and he said, you know, he broke my game down. He was saying, look, you need to do this better. You're doing this very well. And I had a lot of respect for him, because uh, a lot of the top players, you know, they'll win a match, and okay, you don't you don't really see them after that. And, and I thought that was very decent of a, a top player to sit down with me for 20 or 30 minutes and discuss my game. Uh, so let's go for those two. Let, let's keep the Chinese boys out of it uh, yeah. for now. So I'll put, put them in a team. Because uh, I think Oh Sang Un and Alexei Smirnov, career high rankings are probably about five and ten. Uh, and the women's, in the women's, probably for me, Deng Yaping. Yeah. Ding your has got to be right up there and Zhang Yining. Uh, again, I've done a lot of commentating with the ITTF, so I've been able to sit for three or four hours sometimes in, in some of the, the world team championships and watch some of these games. Uh, so so yeah, let's let's go for them. Brilliant. Ewan, what about you? Oh, this is a this is a difficult one just, just off the cuff. Um, okay, my my world three for for the men. Um, I, I it wouldn't it wouldn't win a, a world championship, but partly kind of based on my playing experience as well. I would have Colm Slevin, um, who was okay. We we played against Colm quite a number of times from Ireland, and and Colm was as hard as nails. He was so tough to beat. He was unbel you know, unbelievably consistent. And and we, you know, he was a professional player in Germany and we get some some really good wins. So so as a 
as a yardstick for for an international player. If you could beat Column Eleven, then you were you were a pretty good player. So so he gave you nothing, gave you no cheap points. So so he he would he would be in my team. Um, the other one that kind of crossed my mind was I think the most inadequate I ever felt in a table was when I played Heezy Wen from Spain, Chinese guy played from Spain, and he left-handed pen holder pips and he would kind of swing this kind of left-handed serve all over the place and he was really quick and even I mean he, he was ancient he was about 150 or something when I played him you know years old still he still absolutely thrashed me and it just gave me no time at all and this thing was swinging all over the place and I would spin up and he would smack through it and anyway I got absolutely drunk by him. So, so he'd be in my team just so that I wasn't playing against him um, and then the final one would probably be Jorgen Persson. He was my kind of, I think he was my idol. Um, he was definitely somebody I, I you know, dreamt that I could try and emulate. And probably the best match I ever watched uh, in person was, it was again, it was Sweden-China in the 2000 World Team Championships final in Malaysia. It was kind of the changing of the guard, if you like, the end of the Swedish reign, start of the Chinese reign. And Sweden, you know, Against all odds, one beat China and person won us two, and the atmosphere was just fantastic. So, so he would he would be my he'd be my number one in the team. Um, yeah, women. Um, yeah, I was just trying to think that Denya Ping's a fairly safe bet, isn't she? I mean, she's she's been unbelievable in terms of what she's achieved. Plus, I think also being a real kind of role model and instrumental in what happens in Not Nottingham. So, I think um, I think that that'd be a safe choice. Um, Alison Bro. I think I'd put Alison Bro on the team, you know, as as you know, what a an aggressive style she played. You know, she really kind of broke the mold compared to a lot of the other um players um of, of her era and so you know, so aggressive, so two winged. So she was great. Um and I don't don't recall my third place, I, I don't recall her playing, but from all accounts, uh, Jill Hammersley. Jill Hammersley Parker was was some player. And so I think I would I would put Jill in there as well, so that's a pretty good team. I thought. Uh, what, what was the other part of the question? Well, was I, I think you covered it quite well there. I think you've got some absolutely fantastic players there, an insight of, of what you guys think of players, uh, of what makes a good player. I mean, obviously, we don't have world champions, we do have world champions in there. Uh, so it's a great good mix of players. Uh, I thought it was quite, actually quite funny. But obviously, we had Alison Bro on quite early on, uh, and I credit Alison for Gavin's forehand. Because I sort of shared the story at the time, but I, and it's something my dad still talks about. But me and Gavin couldn't lift backspin. And um, if you let everyone that's watched Gavin play, strength is forehand, topspin. And it, one of the most funniest sessions was watching Gavin hit about 15, 20 forehands in the net because he could not lift Alison's backspin. Uh, and when Ewan mentioned they're aggressive, um, I remember Alison being very aggressive towards Gavin as a young lad, <laughs> basically ridiculing him for not being able to lift the ball over the net. So that was quite a good story to share. Uh, <laughs> it's scary that you know you seem to know so much of this stuff in my early playing days. I just don't remember any of this. I remember Alison laughing at my backhand, but thousands of players have done that. Yeah, uh, many have done that, Gavin, not just yeah. Alison. <laughs> exactly. So I remember her having a go at the backhand. I don't, I don't remember that at all. No, I mean, a lot of stuff is obviously my dad remembering stuff, and he loves to ridicule me. So anything that's a, a story from the past, um, sort of comes up again. But it's just all these things that stick in your mind and obviously remembering these sessions when you mentioned the Leffen Centre earlier. Um, but uh, we'll continue back to Dave's story. Uh, this is your life segment that we're going on. Um, so when you first came to Scotland, Dave, you'd never been. So one of your first questions to all of our guests that are non-Scottish players is memories of Scotland. But you applied or, or basically came in the role of Scottish Director of Coaching, but you'd never been to Scotland. And if you also take us back of how it all came about, because I find that actually a girl from Perth that influenced you um, in applying for the role in the first place. You've got it indeed, yes. I was running, um, I've been Director of Coaching for England. Um, during that time, I, I, I one of the reasons I think it was successful, you know, in in Bristol, uh, you remember us, in, I had Mike Kimber in, in Oxford, I had Dave Joyner in, 
in Devon, I had Adrian Wright and Derek Langley in Newbury and Gail, who you know, um, Ken Muir. So I, I, I had a great team of coaches. Um, and uh, but anyway, but I, I uh, there was a change of administration. A new chairman came in, and we basically wanted to do away with the coaching scheme, and and and, and that's all history. So I was running my own summer schools. I was perfectly happy. I was the London Development Officer, full time job, and it was during my summer school days that um, a girl from Perth, and she was a girl from Perth. Uh, named Nicola Frail came to two of my summer schools and in 1989 she said oh I think uh, Richard you was leaving the post bear, bear in mind by then I'd been to New Zealand Australia America everywhere but I'd never been to Scotland I mean never been it just happened like that <clears throat> and um, and I said oh Oh, right. You know, I said, I'm not surprised. I'm surprised at that, but I guess he's been doing it for four years. And then in, I never gave it any more thought. And then Nicola got in touch with me again. I don't know why she did, but she got in touch with me again in November. And she either sent me the application form for the job or she she told me that the job was now live um, and, and, you, and you could apply for it. And even though I was perfectly happy doing my summer schools with Alison Bro and Nikki Jarvis and Mandy Sainsbury and Colin Wilson, Dave Ott, you know, lots of brilliant players, Gail again. And, and um, I, it, but the buzz, the buzz of taking a national team and going to the world, it just got the better of me. And so I applied for the job and I got it. And Nicola now, Nicola Frail, she runs the army table tennis um, down south, but she's also a army chaplain. So she joined the ministry and, uh, and I had a chat with Nicola yesterday and she doesn't remember. <laughs> I guess because she's been to Kab Kabul, Afghanistan, she's been to Sudan. I think it's probably a little bit more important than telling, you know, talking about a job in Scotland. But yeah, so I applied for the job. I, I got the job, and uh, yeah, you know, um, I've been in Scotland basically for thirty years. And three capitals in one day, Dave. Is that right? So you just story. We're basically playing table tennis, but London, Edinburgh, Belfast. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah it's interesting because on the day of my uh, interview, which took place in Falkirk, um, I flew from London to Edinburgh. And the evening, I was doing some coaching with Alan Strong in Belfast. So I, I flew to Edinburgh, sat the interview, jumped on a plane to Belfast. And that evening, I was coaching, I think it was the, the, the dairy farm school of sport with alan strong and a very young cheeky johnny cowens was on that course questioned everything it did there was a pain in the backside but yeah so yeah all, all on the same day and, and gavin thinks with his career he gets to go to exotic locations in one day uh, around london and abroad but i think dave, dave dave was a master of it back in the day um, and talking about exotic locations dave it's not just been Scotland, England, and Ireland that we mentioned. You've sort of touched upon it earlier. You've had a, was a great story of the Caribbean, but you've coached in some of the far reaches of the world. Can you talk us through where you've been and sort of some of the sessions you've had to do? Um, I've been to 54 countries, and I'll try and, as I say, um, America. I don't 54. Just... Uh, don't worry, I won't. 54 <laughs> countries. But America. Uh, is the one where coaches are valued. Uh, each time I've been to America, you know, that the coaches are put on a pedestal. However, the best table tennis country I've been to, without a doubt, is China. I mean, um, Ewan was at the World Championships when we were there in, in, in Shenzhen in 95. And it was wonderful because a World Table Tennis Championship can take place and nobody in the UK, no, no, they don't even know it's on. They don't even know it's on because it'll be football or, or, or cricket and and uh, but in China um, you would go to the bakery and the baker would be selling cakes and shaped his table tennis bats. You went to the gardens, the floral gardens, and again flower displays. 
and everybody knew it was table tennis and it, it was the it, it, it was just lovely to see table tennis um, given the kind of importance which it should be given all the time. I mean, think of it, table tennis, it's, it's relatively inexpensive, it, it's space efficient, you don't need a lot of room to play, and, um, you know, it, and, and it, it is a relatively cheap, cheap sport, you know, uh, and uh, I, I can't, oh, so, and it is, it's not dictated by weather. So three things, inexpensive, space efficient, not dictated by weather. Table tennis should be much more popular up here. But anyway, so, so China for table tennis, America for coaching, but the nicest country I've ever been to is New Zealand. I was there for um, about three months in 1982 and if you've not been to New Zealand, it's like a warm Scotland. It is, you know, it, it, it's just as nice as Scotland. Similar um, po um, population, but it, the, the weather's lovely. I coached, uh, I, I flew into Auckland. I, I then coached in Manurewa and then went up to Wangarei and down to Hamilton and then Rotorua and back to Wangarei and flew to Invercargill and then Invercargill to Christchurch where we've had all the earthquakes, Christchurch to Westport and then Westport to Wellington. So, you know, uh, uh, but I've spoke to a lot of New Zealanders, a lot of Kiwis, and uh, they say I've been to more places in New Zealand than they have. But, and there was all purpose-built centres as well because land wasn't a It was great. Everywhere you went, it, it might have been a small uh, a small village, but they would have a hut with about four or five table tennis tables. And, and the centre in Auckland, I think it's got about 20 tables. So lots of purpose-built tables. And, and, you know, and I've, I've loved the track, the, the countries that I've been to, but if I had to pick three, I'd go America, China, and New Zealand, all for different reasons. Brilliant. Mark, 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 just, one, yeah. Mark just one of these, one of the things that you maybe don't realise with Dave, but he was a bit of an upgrade king as well in the oh. in our international <laughs> travel. You know, so he liked the challenge. He, he liked the challenge. There so was certainly a couple of times we went to America and he said, right, boys, I'm going to sort this out. I'm going to, I'm going to get his all upgrades in the flight. And I don't know if you can remember any of the stories, Dave. I remember one time, one of the, yeah. our flight from wherever it was, he threw to to wherever it was in America was cancelled and we were transferred onto a different flight. And so all the passengers that had kind of been, been offloaded from one flight flight all piled into this big long queue to try and get transferred onto this other flight to, to Boston or wherever it was. And, and Dave was like, right, let's just hold back. Let's just hold back and no rush, no rush. And so this big long queue of people kind of rushing to get onto this other plane kind of started to whittle down to, you know, smaller and smaller until, the, you know, there were just the last dregs left. And, and that was it. Then, then there was just, the, the people behind the check-in desk, us about kind of 20 yards away, and, you know, flight closing, check-in closing, and, and Dave was right, now's our, now's our time. Now's our, and off he goes up to the desk. <laughs> he said, right, we've come up, we've come from all parts of the country, and the, this flight was our chance to get together and have a team meeting beforehand and, uh, and, and you know, kind of caused all sorts of consternation behind the desk. And the, the people were trying to close the flight and, you know, trying, and there was Dave just causing a nuisance. And, and eventually out of pity after much toing and froing to the supervisor, that's it, we all got upgrades to business classes. <laughs> so there was this half an hour later, we're all supping champagne and eating warm nuts and stuff, you know. Well, just, <laughs> That's really quite a knack, quite a knack. The confidence that Dave has gone from, if everyone remembers the story of tonight's session at the start, of a man that nearly flew a team from Denmark to Johannesburg, and then look at the confidence of years later uh, of getting everyone upgrades. It just shows the caliber <laughs> uh, of how he grew as a coach. Uh, briefly, uh, Gavin and you, and I'll start with Gavin first. I mean, Dave obviously detailed about his favourite table tennis countries. Both of you have had the pleasure and obviously privilege to play table tennis around the world. Gavin, what, where's your where's your favourite country to visit and play table tennis? Those of you know, obviously remember the North Korea story, uh, and obviously visiting there, but what about your favourite place to go? Well, depends. In terms of being successful table tennis-wise, I would say India. <laughs> uh most of the time when I went to India, probably, I think I've been to India six or seven times, Delhi, Jaipur, 
there was another three or four, but uh, I always was always there and I would just have the rice, I would have the naan breads, I would stay away from, you know, the the curries and all, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, so I'd be well. A lot of the times you would have 10 or 15 very good players at a Commonwealth and it would start to whittle down. Players were ill. Players wouldn't make it to the next day. They wouldn't make it to the second or third round. And there was me just sort of creeping through the draw. Uh, and also the in terms of uh, the weather out in India and the tables for, for playing on, the tables were very, very sticky. There was very high humidity. My serves were very, very good. They were checking up. They were going all over the place. So I, I always felt that India was a very successful place for me, table tennis wise. Managed to get to quarterfinals of a couple of individual events out there. I also managed to medal for the team. It was myself, Sean Doherty, uh, Craig Howison, Neil Cameron, Scott Barton. So, so that was good. But probably, you know, a bit like Dave saying, you know, the beauty out in New Zealand, uh, for me, it was probably flying the whole way to Australia. Uh, I hadn't been to Australia until about three years ago. And, and then I, I ended up going to Australia four times in the last three years, uh, where I was basically, you know, hitting the pro tours all the time. But for me, Melbourne was absolutely stunning. And I went there and with my wife, we went on the hot air balloon that flew right over the centre of Melbourne and it went right over the, the tennis courts there. Uh, and and I, just, I just thought, wow, this, this is beautiful. We were there in April or May as well when the temperature was sort of 25 or 26 degrees. So comfortable, you know, for all of us. And yeah, uh, and again, a big challenge getting to somewhere like Australia. You've got three or four flights uh, to get there, but I, I was, you know, quite happy to do that. Uh, and, and yeah, so, so let's go for, for Melbourne. Perfect. And Ewan, if you can finish off our travel segment of our uh, <laughs> uh, um, session. I think, I think two, two of the stick of the mind, uh, as Dave said, America. I think the US w was great. And, and I think maybe that was part because I, I seem to recall that the, the flights were so much cheaper if you went for a week. So, so we ended up kind of, you know, booking out a week. So instead of normally kind of turning up the night before and kind of hastily trying to get half hour practice and then you're, you know, and we actually, you know, got to America, you know, a few days in advance and actually could kind of really prepare properly and, you know, ended up, you know, twice having really good events. So, so America was always a kind of a fond place. I think my favourite though was probably Japan. Um, similar, similar kind of note to Dave in terms of, you know, that, crowd was you know really fanatical if you like and Japan had you know always had really good teams and the food was always great the accommodation was great and and, and you know just really enjoyed the country so so yeah Japan would be my my, my choice. Brilliant. Oh, now, can I, oh yeah. am I allowed to just tell a, a quick one for me? Are no, you I'm sure you see the time we need to get oh, more right. okay. Good. tell me off but uh, a really interesting tale in China was, um, and Billy Gibbs was was uh, very instrumental during my time with um, Table Tennis Scotland or STTA as it was then, and he, he, he was very often the second captain. And was in was in Shenzhen, and he says, "Dave, come here, Dave, come here." And there, there was this absolutely stereotyped Chinese man with his with his hat and his with the bags on, on his side. And then he spoke absolutely perfect English, perfect English. And we said to him, where did, did you learn to speak so well? And it was an older guy. And he says, oh, I was taught by Eric Little. So when Eric Little was in, yeah, so, yeah, so that was a, um, you know, to me, it was a real wow, a real wow moment. He says, no, when Eric Little, after he won the Commonwealth, because this chap would have been a good 20, 30 years older than us, but his English was perfect. And he says, no, Mr. Little, Mr. Little, uh, Olympic, Mr. Little from Scotland. Um, yeah, he taught us. And, but no, he's, yeah. Anyway, so I'm okay. digressing, I can only do. Uh, well, <laughs> nearly kept you in check, Dave, nearly. Um, 
So Holly, Amelia, over to you for any questions on YouTube, any questions that received beforehand. I think we had a question from Ian Rind. So I'll leave it over to you for the next few minutes for firing questions at Dave or any questions that may be coming for you and Gavin as well. Okay, I'll just start off with Ian's one and then Holly can do a couple. So <laughs> a coach has one minute between ends. Generically, what should they cover? I, I think I did cover it earlier. It's where a player is winning the point, where a player is losing the point, and whether a change of tactics is necessary. Yeah. But also, you've got to try and do a forecast of the opponent's tactics. So, so it's no good if, it, if, um, if you win the game 11-3, and then you say, just turn around and do the same thing again, because the other captain's going to sort of say, well, hang on a minute, stop playing to his backhand. So try to predict as well what the other captain might suggest. So, but keep it to those four simple points. Don't try digress because, as, as Gavin said earlier on, it will just get lost. Can, can I add one extra little note to that one? Just, just one of the things I thought Dave was really good at in, when he was in the corner was, regardless whether you won a set, lost a set, whether you won it close, lost it easily, whatever. Dave was really good at resetting, resetting you, and almost regardless of you know the levels of excitement, you'd won, you should lost you, whatever. You know, resetting and then refocusing on the next, on the next set, and and that's always you know sometimes you can go into the next set still thinking about the previous one. You know what went well, what, and actually Dave was really good at just resetting you, rebaselining, and and starting again. And I think that's uh, that's an important one part, part of it as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll ask a question from myself. So if you could go back and change anything in either your playing or coaching career, what would you change? I, I probably would have played, I don't know, I think I would have played a bit longer um, and probably would have parked coaching a little bit, but maybe if I had it done, then, you know, I, I wouldn't have been... Where, where I am now but um, so so not an awful lot really not 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 an awful lot but probably I, I'd have played a bit a bit longer okay I'll pass on to Holly um so a question from Ben is what type hey. of <laughs> um, so one of the questions is what type of fitness training helps with table tennis Holly, could you just repeat that? Because it just went a bit echoey. Um, what type of fitness training helps with table tennis? Well, I, I think it's not what kind of fitness. It is, it is the time. In table tennis, even now, it hasn't changed. It, it is all about periodization. In other words, Desmond, I think Don Parker touched on this, Desmond Douglas was probably the best player in Europe for about 10 years and never won, won the European Championships because he just couldn't quite have those high peaks at the right time. Now, now fitness is like that. Most of your general fitness should be done out of season. Your, your anaerobic, your aerobic fitness, you know, your long runs, but, you know, just working on your slow twitch muscles. But it's, it's as you're tailoring towards the season, then it should be anaerobic, working on, on you know, your fast movers, your quick twitch muscles. And so it's important to um, scale it. And, and little and often, it's the same as practicing. A lot of people make the mistake if they go mad on a fitness regime for about a week and then they can't sustain it. You know, where I... I still, I'm 67 and I still train on a regular basis. So also with, with fitness, what you can manage as well. And then just set yourself little targets. The same with practice. Don't, you know, obviously reach for the sky, but also have your little targets as well. So aerobic fitness during the off season, anaerobic coming towards the season. And then during the season, it should almost be something like 90% table work and then maybe 10% making but lots of stretching, lots of flexibility work during the season. So think of the five S's, as strength, speed, suppleness, st stamina, and then the final one, skill. So the five S's. 
Um, I'll ask one of my own now. So what keeps you passionate about the game? Great question. It, it, it's, it, I, I, it's, it's, it's a, table tennis is uh, a wonderful game. And it, it, you can meet so many wonderful people. You go to wonderful countries. Um, you're learning all the time. You, you know, you've never mastered it. Is I think as the older I've got, I realise that there's a lot more, you know, I, I, I need to learn. And that doesn't change at all. And, and something will happen and you'll think, wow, you know, I've got to improve that. So it's never been satisfied. You know, we, you know I've come away, even coaching Gavin at, at the Worlds, and he's so nearly, so nearly had that big win. And even though he'd done what he won his we seem to forget he had a big win in his group to get there in the first place but oh, damn if we'd have done this maybe if he hadn't have gone for that shot at three love you know wasn't decisive then and, and you know like I was saying with Ewan against Matthew side you know when he rushed the last three points but it, it, it's wanting to learn wanting to improve and really what's keeping me going at the moment is I've, I've got to convince Gavin to stay and compete because Joan Smith can improve at 50. Gavin can definitely improve. He's fit. He's one of the fittest players I've, I've ever witnessed um, of captain. I was, I was it, until February. <laughs> yeah. It, it doesn't have many injuries. You've been quite lucky. And there is improvement there because I've said on these podcasts, is Gavin plays too vertical? I think if he concentrate on transferring his weight more, you know, I still think there's there's a lot of improvement there. Yeah, so all that keeps me passionate. And right. you keep me passionate because, you know, I've been a big champion of, of ladies' table tennis. I want to see it develop. I often think ladies' matches are better to watch than men's matches. You can see what's happening. And, uh, you know, I, and I, I want to promote the girls, you know, and I want you girls to promote yourself as well. And I want you to show everybody in Scotland what table, you know, what a great sport table tennis is for, for girls and uh, women, yeah. And no matter what standard you play, it, it really doesn't matter whether you're playing. Everything is relative. It's relative to the guy who plays in Division 12 with the Nottingham League. To, to, to Gavin and Ewan, to Dan, to Dan Yang Pang, who, who, Yaping, who won 18 worlds. It's all relative, you know, so it's it, just enjoy it, yeah. Brilliant. I mean, we're nearly, well, we are out of time, but I think this is our last session and we're okay to go over a few minutes. Um, Ewan and Gavin, is there anything that you want to, any points that you want to bring up with Dave, anything there, any questions that we've missed? Um, yeah. As our special guest this evening. Go for it, Gavin. I would just like to, to highlight again when, you know, I think Dave came in at a pivotal time for me because uh, I think I was getting to that stage where I wasn't really, you know, too interested with what was going on. And then Dave, you know, put his arm around me and he was like, look, you know, let's, let's focus on, you know, trying to make you a better player, playing a bit more and you know trying to get to the olympics so you know i have to say a big thanks to dave there for the, the amount of time that he spent jumping on planes getting down to birmingham london wherever it was to to have meetings with team gb uh so you know i'm very appreciative of that dave uh and i know that that's you know took a lot you know of your your time and out of your calendar as well. So, so thanks for that. Uh, and one last thing, I think, Dave, you've been brilliant at trying to get all of Scotland working together. You know, getting Glasgow to work with Ayrshire, Ayrshire to work with Edinburgh, you know, starting to develop things in the north, starting to get, you know, just a fairer system, bringing guys like Mark back into the sport. Uh, you know, and it all seems very sensible, but, you know, it takes a brave person to step in there and change things. So, so for that, you know, also I'd like to say, you know, well done for, for changing Scottish table tennis in the last two or three years. Right. 
Ewan? Oh, well, just, just one question that um, I'm sure the, the viewers would like to, to, to know. Um, everyone wants to add a few points to their game. So I was just wondering if Dave could recommend any good books on table tennis tactics. Maybe you can hypothesize one or something like that. However, on a serious note, um, this book is fantastic. The coach, you know, it, it, it's the whole philosophy of coaching. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so I thought, I thought, what I would do just in preparation for for this kind of event, I thought I'll go on Amazon and see what Amazon says oh, about the pocket guide to table tennis. Oh, and what so, did you say? <laughs> there you go. So it must be the only book in the whole Amazon that's got one hundred percent five out of five star ratings. <laughs> so it's got three <laughs> reviews. It's got three reviews, all of them five out of five. I thought, Craig, this is unbelievable. Albeit, I did get a bit suspicious when the most recent one of them was from a book called Colin. <laughs> you know, oh. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it was Dave's best mate, Colin Wilson. <laughs> I started to get a bit suspicious. <laughs> but anyway, so no, I, I jest a little bit. No, I, I think just to, to kind of back up what Gavin said. I mean, obviously, your your contribution to to Scottish Table Tennis has been great, Dave. You know, your previous time as national coach, and clearly it's it's great to have you back in the sport. And and you know, Table Tennis Scotland is, is all the better for your contribution. And you know, thanks very much for what you did to my career. And you know, thanks very much for your friendship, which is you know every bit as important. So, you know, thanks very much. Yeah. Right. Well, that sort of brings us to the end. And I think I hope everyone has enjoyed the last. Well, this is our fifteenth week. Yeah, yeah. I can guess um, it's been, I mean, we've chatted offline where how we was a surprise of success. So hopefully all the viewers enjoyed it. Uh, we'll be back in September with some new subjects, new guests. But I think it's only fitting that the final words um, of the man that's put all this together each week and done the work and speaking to guests is Dave. So Dave, I obviously want to just put one last question to you. What is your future hopes of Scottish table tennis? maybe short term, what are you hoping to achieve over the next couple of years? I'm hoping to convince Gavin to play in Birmingham. I'm hoping that Colin Dalgleish keeps his development and his say, and he does a bit less coaching. And I'm hoping that a Callum Morrison or a Yasser or, or one of the other players, you know, come up to the plate. And I think we've got medal potential. And I'm, I really want to push the girls as well. Uh, you know, I want to give them every opportunity to reach their potential and, you know, and, and, and again, join the men in Birmingham. And, um, yeah, as I say, my biggest regret, if I can have this minute, was it was about 15 years ago and Ewing was still number one, but Gavin was almost coming to the number one and there was a golden opportunity to get a medal in Australia and we had a good team backup players of Neil Cameron Stuart Crawford and we weren't allowed to go so that was probably my biggest for getting to have but, but yeah you know so hopes hopes for Commonwealth medals hope to develop the girls game you know for, from all levels and um, and and you know and, and, a, and a big thanks to my fellow selectors and, and like you Mark we've had 14 guests, um, they've all had different stories, haven't they? they they've all added something to it and uh, they've all given up their time. Uh, and, you know, uh, you know it, it's been a privilege and an honour to be able to, to interview them. And, and, I, felt, and I, I do feel that, you know, we've, we've all been a good team working together. And it's great to have Holly and Amelia, you know, uh, on screen and uh, putting the questions forward. No, it's, it's been a privilege. And on that, everyone have a good night. Thank you very much.